Um, how's your morning been? Excellent topics. Um, I work in public health, so my role is to be Dr. Evil and work public health and all policies in. This is where public health and all policies comes together. So while we're waiting on Dr. Koch, I'll give you a little background about myself. Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers is talking about how difficult it is to get eight states to sign on to an agreement. Okay. I've been part of the Great Lakes Border Health Initiative with a number of your colleagues for many years, almost two decades. We worked to get through the Great Lakes Water Compact where you can't take water out of the watershed, except for one tiny little <laughs> group that bridges. Um, so those are things that public health is an infrastructure. Okay? We know the famine and feast piece. We're more famine, famine, pandemic, tons of money, famine, famine, pandemic, tons of money, famine. So um, I work for the city of Cleveland Department of Public Health. Uh, we are in the midst of working to address decades of infrastructure, inequity, redlining, breaking down neighborhoods intentionally to wall them off with highway projects. So we're looking at how do we address equitable infrastructure issues that we created through redlining. How many of you are familiar with redlining? How many of you are dealing with the impacts of redlining? Lead poisoning, housing, housing inequality. So what we're gonna be talking about today with the panelists is infrastructure equity and how their different realms touch on it. So we have Anna Wolf, uh, Vanessa Iribe, Lydia Ross, and Dr. Elizabeth Koch, Coach. Um, and I'll go through some of the basics, but I'm gonna let them talk about how their projects talk about the who pays for it, who decides, how do you engage your communities, how do you take these projects from these various areas and weave in equity as the warp and weave of the basis for making all your project decisions. So, um, Lydia Ross is a senior strategist for the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, or DCASE. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Koch is from GTI Energy Hydrogen Tech Center and works on hydrogen infrastructure. Vanessa Uribe is the Office of Minority and Economic Empowerment, or OMI, and also the Illinois Department of Commerce and Equity. <laughs> Economic Opportunity. Economic opportunity. <laughs> And Anna Wolf is the Director of Water Equity for the Center for Neighborhood Technology. So I'm going to kind of lead into the panel. Uh, I have some leading questions, and we'll kind of drive them uh, through those. But I kind of want to have them talk about the four core questions of who pays, who benefits, who bears the environmental costs of your decisions, and who decides. So Anna, your closest tag, you're it. <laughs> All right, is this, this is on, okay. Um, hi everyone, great to be here. Um, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Anna. I work for the Center for Neighborhood Technology. I'm the Director of Water Equity. We are a 40-year-old um, Chicago-based nonprofit that works at the intersection of transportation, housing, um, uh, water, with an eye toward equity and affordability in the outcomes that we pursue. Um, our, our mission, sort of most simply put, is to make cities work for everyone. Um, and we do that through authentic community partnership and engagement where CNT acts as a technical partner um, to support the, the needs, the priorities, the expertise of our community partners who know best what they are, um, are pursuing and will serve their residents' interests. So I think in the, the sort of broad scheme of how we, we pursue equity in, the, in our work and how we think about equity and in infrastructure implementation, um, I like to reflect on the phrase build with, not for, uh, design with, not for. Make sure that voices as local as you can get them, frontline communities are at the, the, the table as early as possible um, to ensure that it's authentic engagement. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the simplest way to put it, but it's, a, it's much more complex in operationalizing that sort of engagement. Um, how does one engage communities um, with municipal staff in a community where there's been trust that's been broken? How do you rebuild trust 
Um, so a lot of the work that we do is partnering closely with community-based organizations in Chicago. We're close partners with the Southeast Environmental Task Force, um, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, and we work with them to create, um, we do data analytics, we create tools to support how they inform their campaigns and their policy organizing um, so that when they come to the table with city officials, they're ready to sort of advocate for what they need based on data that's both qualitative and quantitative. Um, that is uh, an effort that we're, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of time to develop these relationships with these community organizations. And it's uh, an ongoing effort to ensure that that level of engagement is is functional because it takes time. And um, another another piece of this puzzle is ensuring that you're paying for folks um, their, their time at the table during that planning and design stage. Um, lots more to say. Maybe I'll pass the mic to, or pass it over to you, Vanessa. So Vanessa. Um, good morning, everyone. Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm Vanessa Uribe. I am with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, if you're not familiar with DCEO, uh, we're kind of the economic uh, uh, engine of the state. Uh, and oftentimes, people think of economic development as a very transactional um, kind of kind of space. And one of the things that DCEO has been very intentional about uh, is really moving towards thinking holistically about our economic investments, infrastructure investments, and how they connect to a number of other factors, right? You'll hear often uh, people speak about intersectionality, um, and that's why I'm so excited about the conference today and this, this conversation, because infrastructure, for example, doesn't happen in a silo. Uh, it affects so many other aspects of a community, and uh, one of the things that's really important when we think about investing in businesses and investing in uh, our economy is that it's not something that happens on its own. We're investing in communities. We're investing in a number of other kind of sectors like jobs, uh, public transit, uh, obviously infrastructure. Um, education, health, uh, you know, and I think during the pandemic we really saw that come to light. Um, and so it, it's not something that happens on its own. And so when we think about how we are operationalizing equity, which we just talked about, how difficult that can be, um, it, it's really uh, an all hands deck approach. Everyone internally and externally should be doing this type of work. It's a culture change. Um, government has been the number one perpetrator of inequities. Uh, redlining, as you mentioned, is something that was sanctioned by the federal government, and we're still seeing many of the outcomes of that today. And so, um, you know, this has to be very intentional, um, and intentionality is what we lead uh, with at DCEO. Uh, it's everything from uh, building relationships with community leaders. So uh, when we talk about having folks at the table who represent the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by many of the inequities that have been um, longstanding. Uh, we, we talk about bringing them to the table, but beyond that, we also want them to have a voice at the table and have power at the table so that they're actually contributing to the decisions. Um, and I think the other piece there is ensuring that we are building trust with many of these community members. So they've been harmed. Um, there's been longstanding issues, as I've said many times. And so so really when we think about uh, how we do the work, it's about engaging community leaders, building relationships with various stakeholders, thinking uh, cross uh, collaboratively with agencies across DCEO, which vary from um, you know, our economic development packages that are more of the incentives and tax credits, to our film department, to our tourism bureau, um, and to the Office of Minority Economic Empowerment, which really focuses on those communities that have been most marginalized. So we're talking about minority business owners, women, people with disabilities, veterans, and really there's a number of other communities that have been disconnected. So we build trust, we also increase access, and then I think the, the, the next step there is, is really building the capacity and the ability for many of the folks that now are aware and have access to these resources to actually take advantage of them. And so 
that's not easy. Um, and so we're really trying to do that. Uh, one thing that we've implemented over uh, throughout the pandemic that we're hoping to make permanent is our community navigator program, um, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it really is a network that's statewide over 100 organizations that are helping us to build these relationships and make the connections. Um, so that's our first step. But I think also there's a lot of internal kind of review of programs and policies uh, so that we can reduce barriers on the front end because they have a long-term impact. And even though our intention is good, it doesn't always equal our impact. And so we have to be very thoughtful throughout the process to make those connections. Okay. Lydia. I don't think my mic is on. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I'm Lydia Ross. Uh, I am here representing the City of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, or DCASE. Um, I'm delighted to also be here representing the arts in our infrastructure conversations. Uh, curious if anyone else here would identify as representing arts and culture in the room. Okay, nice. <laughs> Um, so I currently wear two hats. Uh, I served as the director of public art for the last three and a half years and I'm now a senior strategist working closely with our commissioner, Aaron Harkey, um, to make sure uh, that the arts show up in every conversation we have about equitable neighborhood development. Um, one term that we fight very actively against is this idea of arts deserts. Uh, we have 77 vibrant communities in the city of Chicago. There is no such thing as an arts desert, but there is such thing as disinvestment or lack of investment. So part of what our agency does, in addition to being an active cultural producer ourselves with major festivals in Millennium Park, with the transformation of public art and programming on the Riverwalk downtown, has been really shifting our focus um, under the leadership of Mayor Lightfoot uh, to invest in our neighborhoods. And that includes uh, an increase this year of $26 million to our grants program, which comes from a shift in how the agency is funded uh, through ARPA dollars and through an additional $6 million as part of an interdepartmental initiative called Together We Heal. Um, we believe that artists, uh, often in partnership with neighborhood organizations, can imagine the best solutions. And with, I'm sure, many of the partners that my colleagues on the panel work with, uh, together they are invited through this grant to present these solutions, these activations, and really using art as a tool for social change. Um, in our work specifically around infrastructure, uh, who pays. Um, DCASE often makes use of our uh, other departmental colleagues' funds to make sure that art is integrated into uh, physical concrete infrastructure projects, viaduct improvements, streetscape projects, but also to think about cultural infrastructure. Uh, what organizations show up in neighborhoods that our producers that support artists, that increase professional development and capacity building, that employ all of the folks that go into making public art possible. Um, and largely we do that by uh, working behind the scenes and out in public events to build trusting relationships. Um, but a lot of times you're gonna see artists leading these processes. So I'm really in the background, but artists are at the table as active planning collaborators. We launched an artist in residence program to support planners in our Invest Southwest neighborhoods on the South and West sides. And I think I'll hopefully have a chance to get into um, a new initiative that is concretely tied to public arts allocation in the city's capital plan. Uh, that our artist team decided to call Party, which is the public art reimagining tour with you happening across our 12 Invest Southwest corridors. But I think the name, I, I heard some laughs, but I think having a joyful and unconventional approach to this work starts to shift people's perceptions of who the city is, what we're here to do, and who's out in front leading those conversations. So excited for the conversation ahead. Thanks. 
Dr. Coach. Yes. Hi, everyone. Elizabeth Coach. I'm with GTI Energy. I'm a program manager there. Relatively new to GTI Energy, but let me, if I'm sure very few of you know about GTI Energy. So let me tell you a little bit about them first. They've been around for over 80 years. They're training, a nonprofit training and research institute that looks at really developing, deploying, and scaling low carbon energy solutions. And those are their, the goal is really, their mission is to transform lives, economies, and the environment. So it's really cross-cutting the work that they've been doing, and especially with the really hard to decarbonize um, sectors and industries. So it's a, a lot of great work that we're moving forward on, looking at how we can lower carbon across the different areas and industries. And so I was brought on as a program manager to the Hydrogen Technology Center specifically. And um, as there's a, a growing interest in hydrogen, Moving forward, and as, as many of you know, there's, um, there's going to be a, a lot of um, hydrogen hubs emerging around the country, and so there's a lot of interest in how do we really integrate that. And, and so I was brought on to oversee the development specifically of environmental justice and Justice 40 priorities and plans and how to integrate those into our hydrogen initiatives moving forward. And let me tell you, coming from my background, I know how hard it is to... to like change that mind shift. It is a huge mind shift when you think about our scientists, our engineers that work in the labs and want to deploy technology. It's, it's kind of distant from um, the, the communities that need the benefits the most. And so it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but I, I bring a 27 year career in environmental work focused specifically on applied research, participatory action research as well, that cuts across many different sectors from nature, affordable housing, um, planning, policy, transportation, electrification. So um, there's, and most recently, climate justice partnerships. So there's a, the work that I left in my previous role at University of Illinois Chicago. Um, we have a report forthcoming there on climate justice partnerships, what that looks like. We're closely with Urban Growers Collective here in the south side of um, Chicago in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood and Green Era Energy, and um, to develop what those best practices would, should look like, what they need to include, and how does equitable government governance within any of those partnerships look like? How do you really distribute the funds in an equitable way as well? How do you integrate them in the planning process and start with agreements before you even come with an idea? And so really integrating that process into, into research, deployment, and, and scalability as well. And so that's, that's kind of where my work is now moving over into hydrogen. Before the climate justice partnership work that I was doing, um, I also led a uh, transportation electrification project, a workshop. Sta over 700 stakeholders in the state of Illinois engaged in that process in, in 2020 over across six months. Those workshops were founded in equity. And we laid that foundation for all discussions and made sure that it carried through as we talked about charging infrastructure and how to deploy as well. And so that report came out in 2021, and I'm happy to say that after CJA was um, announced, then lots of people have been using this particular report as a launching point. So really happy to see that that work has, has continued on as well. So um, for all the questions you posed to us, Pat, um, you know, it, it, it cuts across everyone. There's nobody that we should just say is responsible for any one particular area. We need to think about it holistically. We need to, to integrate it. One thing I'm working on as well with some of the researchers as they, they start to think about even lab scale work, now is the time to kind of reach out to communities. Think about where your technology is going to be and reach out to those communities, get them engaged. How do you start to build that um, like outreach awareness let them know about these technologies, what are the benefits, and let them be engaged in the process of, of your thoughts as well, in the process of research, and, and how can you build those community scholars, the, the capacity that those communities bring to you also are, are real valuable concepts. And so those are, are things that I'm all trying to work into when I'm doing at the um, GTI Energy and the Hydrogen Technology Center. Okay, um, so you've heard a, a number of different kind of areas and lenses on this with equity being centered in all of that. So how do you authentically engage the communities? Not just in having them come to the table when you've already put your plan together, but in deciding on the questions. So how do you bring them in early to help shape what questions and what problems are we going to solve? So, um, 
Anna, if you could talk about how you've worked to reduce barriers on green infrastructure projects. I know a number of you can fit right along in with that discussion. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, CNT has done a lot of work on green stormwater infrastructure, nature-based solutions, nature-based stormwater solutions as they're also called. Um, understanding the benefits that can be quantified to get a larger, up, greater uptake by municipal practitioners and using them for compliance efforts at the municipal level and also just sort of standard, you know, flooding mitigation tactics throughout a community. Um, but green infrastructure is often perceived as a gentrifying or displacing force um, in, in some neighborhoods because it has the real or perceived um, uh, outcome of increasing property values. And if there isn't um, great home ownership, if, there is, if, if an area is perceived or received, uh, you know, decades of disinvestment, the investment of green technologies can also often be uh, not necessarily a welcome uh, uh, addition to, to a community unless it's, it's approached the right way. So some, a lot of the work that we've done has been to sort of flip the script on green infrastructure can solve these stormwater management, water quantity, water, water quality issues, but rather lead with what, you know, engaging in communities by asking the question, what are your priorities? And when you're engaging, when we've engaged in that way, we're showing up to tables in which those conversations are already happening, right? We're not creating a new table and inviting folks into that conversation. We're showing up to existing town halls, block club groups, church meetings, working with partners like Faith in Place and the other CBO or, uh, organizations I already named, um, and listening to them on what their existing campaign strategies are and seeing how green stormwater infrastructure or other sort of climate resilience um, adaptation and mitigation strategies can fit into their existing portfolio of work. And then, from there, understanding what the, the right proliferation of the strategy is. If, if it's a demonstration project for education purposes, in one program, we've paired that with, with public art to, to create more of that sort of cultural resilience alongside the climate resilience outcome. Um, so it's not just planning for stormwater management benefit, but also sort of understanding what does community resilience look like? What does it mean to, to stay in your community and make sure that the infrastructure that's being brought to the community is built for you, not for a future a population who's going to move in once the property values increase. Um, and again, this work doesn't happen just by CNT alone or by a municipal agency alone. It has to happen and be led by community organizations who are on the ground and who represent frontline um, individuals. Um, there's a, a great sort of spectrum of community involvement. Um, I'm blanking on the, the group that put it together, but it ranges from the sort of checking the box of having done a listening session maybe um, at one end of the spectrum and complete sort of community ownership of the project at the other end. We're there from the start to finish deciding what gets invested, who's, who's benefiting, um, what's the scale of investment, and what does the maintenance plan look like at the end of it. And it can be scaled up or down based on whatever project um, you know, is being talked about. And of course, some of these conversations get more complicated the bigger the project or level of investment in infrastructure gets. But that's one way of sort of approaching this conversation of authentic engagement and re reducing barriers is to start with community priority, not with like, we have to spend these money, this, these funds, and they have to sp be spent on this. So let's figure out like, let's ask the questions about where, where the project that we've already sort of conceptualized has to go. Even if that's the case, you can still flip the script and, and approach the, the conversation uh, in a little bit more of a um, sort of community-centered approach. Okay. And then Vanessa, how does that tie in with your community engagement, community navigator networks? Um, yes, I got the right one. <laughs> um, so so it, it, it's exactly that. I think it's, it's that we are um, participating in uh, conversations that have existed at the community level. It's being committed to ensuring that um, there's diversity in stakeholders present. And so, for example, if we're talking about one type of project or if we're talking um, about a workforce development model, right? There's a new job training program. We really want, um, you know, there's CJA pass. There's going to be a lot of green energy jobs. How do we ensure that we're getting these to the communities that need the most? And so coming into a conversation of workforce stakeholders, for example, Example that already exists uh, is important, uh, but it's also important to think about all of the other needs that are there. And so, having an ear to the barriers and the gaps is very important. Um, our community navigator program helps to 
formalize that a little bit. So our Community Navigator program includes over 100 organizations across the state. These are economic development organizations, local chambers, community-based organizations, local municipalities, et cetera. And the idea is that we are speaking to and hearing from, right, because it's a two-way street, um, those that have a pulse on the ground, those that can tell us, yes, a project here would be really important, and yes, the investment here is needed, but we need to think about X, Y, and Z. And we wouldn't know that sitting at the DCEO table on our own. This is only possible through that committed engagement through folks at the community level who are leaders and understand their communities best. Um, I think the other piece to that is that it's not simply around a specific project. We can't come to the table only when we have funding or only when we have something coming down the pipe. It has to be long-term. It has to be something that's ongoing. When we talk about building trust, you're not gonna do that if you come and go only when there's resources or only when you need something. This has to be a long-term commitment. This has to be an authentic commitment. Um, and it's something that is you know, ongoing. Um, the only other thing that I think I'd pull from all of that conversation is that um, the intersectionality of this work is important. And so when we talk about building trust, it's long-term. When we talk about you know, having different people at the table, that's also important. But you go back to your own resources and to your own programs and think about what can be leveraged where even within the Department of Concert Commerce, and I know we have a few folks uh, in the room, uh, some of my colleagues, you know, oftentimes it's easy for us to get into silos within our own agency. And so breaking down silos um, is really, really important for us to really get at the intersectionality of all of the needs that come with specific investments or communities in need. Um, and so breaking down the silos is just as important as that long-term commitment and building trust. Um, so Lydia, can you talk a little bit about how the impact of COVID and the broadband infrastructure, when we're talking about infrastructure and the impact of the arts and how your projects may have worked to build into Chicago's infrastructure during this period? Sure. I, uh, that's a big question. Um, and I, I would say there, you know, broadly speaking, uh, as I said in my kind of introduction, we really shifted, uh, we put a lot of kind of internal advocacy work into uh, exploding our grants budget. Um, we had one of the, we are the third largest city in the country and we had one of the smallest uh, annual grant budgets of any cultural agency. Um, it was about 1.7 million a year before the pandemic. Um, so really, again, putting putting trust into um, both the amazing network of artists that live in Chicago, but also creating new programs, um, starting with the Artist Response Program that was both uh, large-scale direct grants. We made uh, $500,000 grants to artists, which was the largest kind of dollar amount as an individual artist grant that we had given, and this was in the beginning of 2021. Um, but we also created a re-granting program. Um, I think we, uh, one of the words that I wanted to just layer onto the, all of the comments and uh, insights that my colleagues shared was transparency. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, yeah, we have to be transparent in what's possible, what we know, what we don't know. And we don't know everyone out there who's doing the work and we don't know how to reach everyone. So we created as part of this artist response program, uh, our first regranting initiative where we looked to uh, trusted capable groups like the Inglewood Arts Collective that is super networked in their home base of Inglewood on the south side, um, but they also have an amazing team. You know, some of them live in Bronzeville, South Shore, other areas, West Garfield Park, and we're able to put a call out and also, frankly, uh, leverage their graphic design skills and the ability to speak in non-bureaucratic terms about the opportunity to uh, get money through the city. Um, and then really provide that ongoing bridge to say, okay, this might be the first time you ever got a $2,000 grant from the city to do a really small project on your block, 
but we're going to help you in a way that, again, frankly, our limited staff that is based downtown and trying to take care of the whole city really can't do. Um, so I think it's, you know, but again, that, that trust builds bridges. And once somebody has gone through that first $2,000 grant, there's an artist right now that's now working on a fencing project with us in partnership with planning and development. But we probably wouldn't have known about that artist or started to build that relationship um, without that inf artistic cultural infrastructure. Um, and then the other you know, main project, uh, literally in terms of infrastructure, is this um, party initiative I was mentioning before. Uh, again, we have to be transparent. A lot of times uh, through our percent for art ordinance, um, art opportunities come around in disinvested neighborhoods because a new library is being built or our joint public safety training campus is being built and we have money committed to building something. It is not an unlimited palette of ideas. There are constraints from construction. There are constraints and we have to be honest about that, but creativity thrives in constraints. So the questions that we ask um, our community members, our neighbors, and our artists have to be based in what power and agency do they actually have to see that input turned into impact and physical results. Um, the last thing I'll say is that this party initiative, um, and I'm so glad we, they came, the artist teams came up with that name, and I'm like, uh, I think the city can, yeah, <laughs> let's call it party. That's amazing. And it says the acronym stands for what it is. Um, but we made a really intentional decision to spend two years uh, having authentic um, design and scoping conversations. That's what party is. Um, that's really saying, again, being transparent about what these funds can and can't be used for. It's public way. It's, it's again, it's not an unlimited imagination, but let's focus our creativity within these constraints, which also unleash unlimited possibilities to transform the visual landscape of these neighborhoods. Um, so we don't know where this money is going to go yet. Uh, we've just started this conversation and it's really exciting. You know, artists are leading it and it is an opportunity to say this is not a totally open canvas no constraints, but we don't, we, you have to tell us what the end results are. We're not going into it knowing yet. Um, and so that kind of leads into uh, Elizabeth. Uh, tell me how you've been intentionally and transparently working in environmental climate justice into the business end of energy infrastructure. That is a fantastic question, and it's certainly been difficult, um, challenging to say the least. Um, and I'm going to bring up the, the newest issue or challenge or opportunity. I won't, actually, it's all of those, which is the um, hydrogen hubs that are going to be coming out, right? So the, the FOA hasn't been released yet, but they have told us that you know the equity plan that they're expecting is going to be worth 20% of the scoring criteria, right? So um, also what you know is that there's a 50% cost share. That means industry needs to be involved. That means you need to have partners in place that are ready and willing to provide 50% cost share to millions of dollars, right? So this is, this is a huge challenge, huge opportunity. But when you look at that equity plan and you, you look at the four components, um, you know, there's so little time to really get that done by the time that FOA comes out. Um, and, and so this is where, you know, for months now I've been working with a lot of people having these conversations. You need to get all of these different groups, entities working together. You need to get them engaged. They have to be part of the planning process. And in some instances it's been working really well and others not so much. There's some politics depending on the region, depending on the state, depending on the locality, right? So, so I think that there's a lot to overcome there um, just across the board. And you can think about these efforts when you look at that equity plan, it consists of four different areas. Um, the first one being quality jobs and skilled workforce really important um, because that is what's going to continue to sustain communities beyond just the grant dollars and beyond what, what technology is going to be dis deployed or what infrastructure is going to be deployed because there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that's going to be built from these hydrogen hubs. Um, and then the next one is really um, community engagement. 
And let me tell you, there's very few entities, organizations out there that understand how to do this in-depth community in, um, engagement. I'm lucky, very fortunate to be up here with a number of people that actually are, do know how to do this, do know how to engage on multiple levels. Um, and, and so this is, this is great to see that it needs to happen more so and across the board. Um, so the community engagement part is a really critical piece. Then they've expanded DEI to include accessibility. So it's DEIA. And so there's an additional component now to, to that um, piece of the equity plan. And then last but not least is the, the Justice 40 priorities. Now, those are, are, are really important. They're cross-cutting as well. And when you put this entire equity plan together, it's not one that you can just check a box for. It's not one where, okay, we've got the technology, we've got the, all the regional partners together, we, we know what kind of, we know who our, use, our end users are gonna be for our hydrogen, but yet we haven't gotten our community partners on board. We haven't gotten our labor unions on board. We haven't got, so those are critical pieces. And so I was really happy to see that Kelly Cummins um, mentioned that the battery manufacturing FOA came out and the equity plan was there because right away I was on top of that. I was like, here we go, we know what's coming. And so we can start really in-depth planning because let me tell you, scientists and engineers, they want to wait until they have the, the real information. And they, it's, so it's complicated. Same thing with industry. I've had a number of people reach out to me from industry as well, saying, how do we start to implement environmental justice into our work, into the work that we're doing with our clients? They're all asking about this as well. And so it's, I'm glad to see it's happening. I, I'm just going to say this as a, as a closing comment. I, I feel like I've been doing environmental justice for 27 years. It may have been called something else, you know, 27 years ago, but this is the work that, that is really foundational to, to empowering our communities and offering them the, the opportunities to really have long-term sustainability and economic viability. And that's how we need to approach it. And I kind of want to wrap on that piece is the, the questions from industry just being at the point where you can ask these questions of your own structures. How do we begin this work? If you haven't begun it already, that's the where you start. So reach out to your partner agencies. I want to thank the sponsors and Ken for pulling this together. I mean, this is really incredible work. Now, I'm in public health. I've been in it for 25 years, so call it whatever you want, but environmental justice is part of that. And I've been planting seeds and foundation pieces for 25 years. So if you want to check out some good work, check out the Build Health Challenge projects. And uh, Dr. Majora Carter, why do I have to leave my neighborhood to live in a good neighborhood? She wrote a book on it. She grew up in the South Bronx. Fantastic book, fantastic speaker, touching on all of these things. How do we make our neighborhoods better? Because wherever you're from, you live in a neighborhood and you want that neighborhood to be healthy, safe, and thriving. So I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to, to work with these folks and, and peel this out of them. 